Welcome to another week in the teacher's room, and we're all excited. We've got a good little room here started. Uh, ITDI is the International Teacher Development Institute, and it's uh, evening here in Japan. A very special guest and a uh, very special good friend, Marcos Benavides. Hi, Marcos. Hello. You're happy to be here, I know. So we're... Uh, yeah, happy to be here. Happy to see you guys again. Uh, it's not that often we get to talk these days. Yeah, we were Pleasure. we were reminiscing the other day about all those long chats we used to have at, at university years ago. But um, everybody's busy, hey? Right. Yeah. So anyway, the uh, we've actually got a title on this week: uh, the teacher's room, uh, language learner to materials writer. And um, so it's been a long time since I've had a chance to talk with Marcos. And maybe for many of you, uh, Marcos is a is a famous but new teacher <laughs> that uh, we want to go in for the next, I guess, 45, 50 minutes or 50, 55 minutes, uh, go into a discussion. And sort of the rules for everybody is it's uh, wide open. We go where the conversation takes us. We have a chat button down at the bottom of your page. If you want to click on, you'll see a chat box. I have it open, so I'm watching as questions come in. If you want to um, add something, we're more than happy to try to squeeze in as many questions as we can. Um, uh, Marcos, you're free to um, answer as, as much or as little. You're free to throw things back at me or anybody else. It's just we take it where it goes. You ready? Yeah, sure. Okay, here we go. So, title starts with language learner to materials writer. What does language learner mean? Um, well, so I, I, I don't know how many people, uh, many people may not be aware, but my English is in fact my, my second language. Wow. Um, my family moved to Canada from Brazil when I was 11. And so, uh, before that age, I didn't speak English at all. I had to learn uh, basically from the age of 11, uh, maybe wow. 10 and a half, 11. And wow. uh, I, I learned uh, quite quickly um, within a year. So I arrived in Canada, I was in grade five, yep. which meant that I missed grade four uh, because of the switch. Um, and in grade five, I was in an ESL class um, Pull out. So when when my uh, my my other my my colleagues my my grade five class were in uh, English, I would get pulled out and do ESL. Yeah. Is and, this in uh, Toronto, Toronto area, Ontario? Yeah, near near Toronto, a city called Mississauga. Yeah. Um, and uh, that was in grade five. Grade six, I was in a regular class without any ESL support at all. And, and by the end of grade six, I was actually the top student in my class in English. Um, wow. uh, and, wow. and that was a quite quick um, learning uh, curve, I, I suppose. And, and I've always um, thought, I've always known that the reason for that was because of reading. Yeah. Uh, I, I used to be a very avid reader in Portuguese before I moved to Canada. Yeah. And of course, this was pre-internet. Um, so when I moved to Canada and I wanted to keep reading, I just couldn't find Portuguese books. So it forced me quite quickly to, to switch to, to English books. And I started just reading, you know, just voraciously what, what I could. And, um, and so very quickly, I, I became very proficient in English. Um, you know, uh, language teachers will know that the, there are some uh, benefits to, to various languages, benefits and deficiencies. Yeah. Um, differences between the two the languages and coming from Portuguese to English was a, a big big uh, benefit for me because I already had a built-in uh, academic vocabulary uh, Latinate words that in English are um, are the the higher level uh, yeah. uh, academic language that in Portuguese are the the, the standard words that, so for, for me just trying out you know when I didn't know a word I, I would sort of try to guess and I'd sort of anglicize a Portuguese word, um, and quite often I'd be right. Oh, that's wonderful. So, um, talk so talk a little was, bit about your, uh, the, you had once told me, uh, it was very late at night one time when we were having a deep discussion, and you talked about the Dungeons and Dragons experience. Right. Yeah, right, so when, around that age, 11, 12, 
I, uh, I was reading a lot and I was reading a lot of science fiction and things like that, fantasy books. My dad was into that, so he got me uh, excited about that and comic books as well. And, um, and I got together with some friends and, and Dungeons and Dragons was really big at the time. Um, this was in the early 80s, mid 80s. And uh, it's a game, it's a role playing game where you imagine you're a character going through various adventures and you, know, you have your own character, it could be a warrior or a magician or something like that. Um, a magic user, I should say to use the proper te terminology. Uh, the, the thing with Dungeons and Dragons is that it's a set of rule books um, that are you know, 300, 400 pages long, each of them. Wow. Um, and, and all it is is rules, rules for how to play the game, um, how to make characters and so on. And uh, I, my friends and I read those books cover to cover, even though they're not actually reading books. Um, we, we would know, for example, that, uh, you know, a certain kind of information was on page 20. We turned to the page in the book. We, we knew the books by heart. Um, and a lot of high, again, you know, academic vocabulary, like uh, words like charisma and constitution and so yeah. on, were all part of the character sheets. So that, that really helps with developing um, language. And of course, the, the communicative nature of the game, because you're, you're basically telling stories to each other um, in a small group. So that helps with fluency. Um, it, it, it was just, and, and creativity and critical thinking as well because of the nature of the game as a kind of strategy uh, game. So it, it, uh, it had so many benefits to, to me as a, as a learner that of course at the time as a, as a kid, I didn't really uh, think about very much. But later when I became a materials writer, I started looking back and thinking back on these experiences that I had as a, as a kid. Sure. And realizing that it really helped form um, a lot of my approach to, to teaching and to, um, to materials development. Um, so just before I get into those materials kinds of questions, um, uh, did, did you have, uh, what, what was your path from you're in grade six now and, and you're, you're kicking butt on this English language and then moving from that into the ELT world as a, as a teacher. How did that happen? Um, well, so I got really uh, excited about literature. Um, as oh. I went through high school and, and I, I enjoyed writing poetry and, and things like that. I was really into um, literature. So I did a, a degree in literature. My, my bachelor's was in um, English literature. Yeah. And so when I finished that, my four year degree, I, I came to Japan on the JET program. Oh. Um, and that was my introduction to teaching. I, I hadn't really been thinking specifically about teaching languages at that point. Um, I was just interested in languages and interested in literature specifically. My, 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 my dream at the time really was to, 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 to go to graduate school, get a PhD, basically get into uh, literary theory, literary criticism. And, and writing as well, I, you know, actual fiction, fiction writing, poetry writing. Um, but uh, yeah, I came to Japan on the JET program and really sort of fell in love with teaching. Um, it was something I was good at, I, I enjoyed very much. And, uh, and, and that's where it sort of kicked in, that, that sort of childhood learning experience that I had had learning English um, suddenly started manifesting itself through my own teaching because I, I'd see my students struggle uh, to learn uh, the language and, and I think of ways to, to help them to get motivated to, to engage with the language and so on. So it reminded how, me how, how long were you teaching before you realized that you really loved this teaching gig? Yeah, it was, uh, I guess, by my second year on the JET oh, wow. program. Wow. Um, I, 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 I started thinking more seriously about this. I was like, wow, you know, this is a... a proper career path I, I, I should consider. And then um, I finished JET. At the time, you, you couldn't do more than three years on JET. Okay. Um, which is good, actually, because it forced me to go back to do uh, my master's. Um, and at the time, there, there weren't so many um, options to do a master's uh, online. Yeah. So I went, I went back to Canada, did it at the University of Calgary, and then came back to Japan. In, in between that time, I met my, uh, my, my then-to-be fiance uh, who is Japanese so uh, at, at, the, at the time I was thinking of getting into language teaching but I wasn't necessarily thinking about coming back to Japan but uh, because I met her and then 
came back here. And so I've, I've sort of, you know, my, my whole time in Japan, I've been here for 20 years now. It, it's always been, uh, you know, oh, two more years and then I'll go back to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, now I've got a, you know, a mortgage, and a car, and three kids, and they're all Japanese. So I, yep. I, I think yep. I'm here pretty much. You have your roots. Yeah. yeah, we hear you. We hear you on that one. Uh, just um, briefly, uh, just can you let everyone know what the JET program is for people who've been wondering? Yeah, the JET program is a Japan Exchange and Teaching program, and the um, it's a massive uh, Japanese government program that uh, hires um, recent graduates from universities from English-speaking countries to come to Japan to be assistant language teachers (ALTs) in the um, Japanese high schools and junior high schools and uh, and now elementary schools as well mm. um, and so it, it, it gives you an opportunity to 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 sort of learn the system in a way uh, as, a, as a junior member of the, uh, the faculty mm. um, at the time uh, they were actually specifically looking for people who had no teaching experience uh, I don't know how that has changed uh, on jet over the years but at the time it was e actually easier to come if you didn't have any English teaching experience um, for, for various sort of political reasons as well, I think. Um, mm. part, part, part of it because they, they were getting these uh, people from outside to suddenly parachute into a school. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and probably they didn't want, you know, the, 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 the outside guy coming in and start talking about methodology that the, the, the teachers at the school wouldn't be able to implement and things like that sort of like task-based learning and you know me coming in with the, <laughs> but, but that was after that was after the master's a pocket a pocket full of tasks ready right. to, yeah. to, to leap out um i remember the one the just i just thought of this because i think of materials with you but the very first textbook i remember ever using was coast to coast a mm. uh, long, long time ago, and and uh, that was uh, in what eighty, eighty nine, ninety or something, and wow, it was a big. Yeah. It was kind of like the interchange of of its time, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I remember uh, just people, all of us suffering through that mm -hmm. in the in the most dutiful, painful way possible. Right. All committed to learning. Um, so. Right. I, I want to move into, so you're, you're out of the JET program, you've gotten the MA. Uh, did you find the MA to uh, give you lots of, uh, fill in lots of uh, gaps or how, how was that? Yeah, it, it helped me to contextualize a lot of what I had seen in Japan, but not quite understood what was meant to be going on. Uh, so right. for example, uh, communicative language teaching was, was a big wave at the time. Yep. Um, and so I came into these schools where they, they had these new classes called oral communication yep. um, or advanced oral communication, something like that, where they were supposed to be teaching communicatively, but in fact, we're just doing a lot of dialogue work from, from textbooks, just repeating, you know, the yep. sort of audio lingual stuff. Um, and I never quite understood where this all fit in because I didn't have any background in, in ELT at all at the time. And when I went, so when I started doing my master's and I started learning a little bit about, um, well, the, about methodology and approaches and so on, it, it helped me to see what the government had been trying to do in promoting communicative language teaching and also understanding how it failed to, to take effect, uh, partly because of the, the kind of the, the, the conservativeness um, of the system of, uh, the testing uh, focus uh, in high schools and so on. So I, I, I really got a big sort of bird's eye view picture a, a little bit and helped me when I, when I came back to Japan. And so how did, how did that uh, frustration, I guess, you, you, had a, you had a more critical eye coming back after the masters, right. whereas in the first few years, we're all just trying to figure out what's going on and how to get through, what do I do next? you know, and, right. and stuff. But I, I imagine you had a little more critical eye with some experience in that. But then when did the, was it frustration with materials that you were using that, that became a, a catalyst or was it something else? 
yeah, it, it was frustration with materials in, in the context of the certain of certain classes that I was being asked to teach. Um, when, when I was doing my master's, I was very fortunate to be part of, um, uh, I was research assistant on a, on a big longitudinal study in Canada looking at immigrants and their rates of acquisition. Yep. And uh, in order to participate in that study, I had to be trained as a Canadian language benchmarks uh, assessor, which is the Canada's equivalent to the um, common European framework, yep. which is a, a task-based framework, basically. Um, I mean, it, it can be used in, in very non-task-based ways, but it's, uh, it, it's essentially what task-based, it, it, you know, it, it's a descript, language descriptor system that helps you to see how language can be used for meaningful purposes rather than just a, a series of discrete uh, forms. So I, I had some really good experience uh, um, learning uh, about TBLT uh, from my professors and also from participating in the study and, and learning about uh, the Canadian language benchmarks. So that when I came back to Japan, I was teaching part-time at a university in Okinawa and um, I was given a, a course called, uh, I think it was called Advanced, Advanced Oral Communication, something like that. Um, and I was told, you know, do whatever you like, choose a textbook. Um, and so when I asked what the level of the students were, uh, was, and, and they, there, there was no level, students would self-select in. Um, and so I ended up, the, the, the course was very mixed level. And so any textbook, any traditional textbook that I tried to choose was very frustrating because it was either too easy for the uh, high level students or too difficult for the low level. You know, it, it, you could never get the level right because yep. they were based on language proficiency. Mm. Um, and that's what made me start to sort of go back to task-based learning and go, wait, I can do something that's not based on language proficiency level, but rather on tasks. Uh, that are meaningful um, and if I focus the lessons on tasks then students will be able to do it whether they're low level or high level even in the same class because they'll mm. be working with that task outcome in mind yeah. and so that that's really what got me started it wasn't so much that I wanted to get into materials writing um, I was just trying to solve this problem of what to do with the textbooks that weren't working and so I started developing some mm. materials with a colleague of mine in, in Okinawa Chris yeah. Yep. Um, and um, and that's where the the idea for our first book widgets came from so welcome you've um, you've gotten through the first part of the interview with stellar <laughs> stellar um, comments uh, we're moving now into exactly task-based learning uh, mm -hmm. TBL or TBLT and and that's bringing us into the the development of your first book but just for anybody in the audience uh, uh, I have found uh, a bit of a range in people's understanding of tasks and it seems like it should be the starting point for this kind of discussion to define uh, our terms. So right. how do you, how do you uh, define it and give us some examples of tasks? Um, yeah, th this is, un unfortunately, th th this is a big problem. In, yeah. in TBLT is this sort of mis, misdefinition and, and also the fact that the, the word task has become ubiquitous in, in language teaching. People use it interchangeably with, uh, to, you know, to mean activity. Yeah. Um, and of course, that's the, 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 the standard meaning of the word in English. But in task-based learning, the idea is that the task is, is a unit of instruction or assessment. It, it, it's a... Um, it's a kind of self think of it as a, as a block of, of, of it, it's the thing you look at. It's the thing you teach, the thing you measure, right? Um, and it's, it's helpful in, if you think of it that way, um, because it helps you to kind of delineate what you're doing when you're teaching communicatively. Um, that's always been a little bit of the problem with communicative language teaching is that it's a little bit vague and abstract. Uh, we, we all agree that, that, that language should be used for communication. Um, and, and, you know, most teachers try sincerely to do it in the classroom. Um, but the problem comes when, when you start, when, when you hit the problem of, you know, how do you sequence things? 
um, or how do you assess them? How do you grade students at the end? Um, and we, we all agree that it's nice to have students you know, sit down and have a conversation, but you can't do that and then sit there with a clipboard checking off how many grammar mistakes they're making because that undermines the nature of, of that, this sort of generative conversation that, that allows students to. So tell me a few, what are, what are a few of the, the typical tasks and what are a few that are, are things that are not tasks? Right, so there, there are several different definitions of what a task is, but, but everyone pretty much agrees on, on Rod Ellis's, uh, Ellis and Shintani from 2014, their definition of a task, which is number one, um, meaning is, uh, it, 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 it's, uh, uh, it's meaningful, it's a meaningful, I'm not going to remember all four now off the top of my head. Um, me meaning is primary. Um, it's uh, number two, there's a, a gap. There's a reason to communicate. Right? Okay. Uh, number three, there's a set outcome for the task, which is authentic or meaningful in a, in a real world sort of sense. Okay. Um, and, and furthermore, it doesn't necessarily need to be linguistic in nature. That, that's a little bit of a problematic thing that teachers get kind of hung up on, but let's leave that aside for a minute. And, and number four is that it's assessed based on that, um, on that outcome. So what, what that means is that a task is, is something, um, if, if you imagine things you do in the real world, yeah. whether or not they're linguistic in nature, they're, they're tasks, right? Mike Long, for example, would define that as the, the, the target task. Um, so something like, for example, writing a thank you letter yep. is, is something that people do in the real world. Um, now, what you do in the classroom is a pedagogic task, um, which if you think about that, that real world target, it, it's a little bit reduced from that sort of systematized in a way that fits into the classroom and the situation. But it's still authentic in, in many ways. Um, so when, they, when you come, for example, to assessment, how do you assess something like a thank you letter? Mm. Um, well, you, what you don't do is you start enumerating linguistic items and checking for spelling and so on, at, at least not primarily. Right. Primarily, what you do is you look at the outcome, right? So a thank you letter, what's the outcome of a thank you letter? I'll, I'll, I'll pose the question. What, what does a thank you letter do, basically? Well, what's the purpose Thanks of it? Thanks somebody for doing something. Yeah, so to, so to assess whether a thank you letter, whether the outcome of the task is achieved, yeah. would, would be, does the reader feel thanked yes. right? in, in an appropriate way or in, in an adequate way, right? Yeah. That would be the, the, the first sort of um, decision. Yeah. And then, of course, secondarily, you can look at how good it was done, and that could include linguistic items uh, like checking grammar and giving feedback, of course. Hmm. Um, but in a, in a nutshell, that's a task, right? It's something that you can kind of point to in the real world and say, it's a thing we do. Yeah. Um, and it could be, it, it, uh, one of the misconceptions with TBLT is people think it has to do with um, uh, group work or with speaking only. And it doesn't, a task could be anything. Mm -hmm. uh, writing tasks, reading tasks, speaking, uh, listening. Um, uh, do, do, we need to, do we need to go into a, an example or two of what's not a task, or do you think that's normally not um, necessary? Right, so what's, what's not a task is something that, that doesn't have, and, and, and if, if you push the question a little too much, you'll, you'll see that it breaks down a little bit, right? So just, just hold off a little bit, but um, something that you don't do in the real world, right? We'll start from there. So something, something like a, a grammar worksheet is not a task. Okay. Um, it's, it's completely contrived. It's not something that, that um, has any kind of real world function in any way. Mm. Um, if I and, write, write a hundred words about your family. Write a hundred words about your family is tasky. Uh, it, it depends how you frame it, depends okay. how you pose it, depends yep. how you restrict it by either pre-teaching or not pre-teaching certain items, right? Yep. Um, write about your family uh, could be a task if you set it up as, you know, write a letter to your friend telling them about your family. Okay. It, yeah. it becomes a little Protection. bit more realistic. Yeah. 
so if you if you think about that as a kind of continuum mm. um, towards a, a target task, which is something that you 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 actually do do in the real world, mm. um, you can see that that there are elements of taskiness mm. that that sort of incrementally you know if you go up the scale or down the scale. Um, if now, you were a, to is that a word you got from Rod Ellis or is that a Benavides <laughs> original? I, I can't remember where I got it. I, I may have coined it, but uh, I, I don't remember Rod Ellis actually using the word taskiness. But uh, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so, sounds more like Stephen Colbert, right? Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So, are you? Um, uh, I, I'm just. Uh, I, I'm watching the clock here as well. I, yeah. I keep pushing you, but um, are you convinced that TBL or TBLT is? the best or or the 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 most accessible or or uh, optimal or how how far do you go for japan or for an efl context well so for an efl context as, as you and phil know um and, and i know you're interested in fluency uh, yep. as, a, as, a, as a construct as a, as a question um it's it's especially important in in an efl um, environment because mm -hmm. Once the, the students leave balance. the classroom, yeah, hmm? yeah. the lack yeah. of balance between input output. Um, yeah. That's right. That's right. So it, it, it provides you know a, a certain level of authenticity that they can't get just by walking out the door the way you can in an ESL environment. So that that's really important. Um, it's also motivating and in a kind of practical way because students see immediately what it is that they're doing, and and they can describe their level of um, proficiency. Because you, if you're using can-do statements, again, think back to the Common European Framework and, and so on, Canadian language benchmarks. You know, when you've written a, a, a thank you letter, you can now say, "I can write a thank you letter," and that's a much more meaningful way of describing your language ability than saying, "You know, you have X on a TOEFL or TOEIC." It, it's a meaningless number in, in a in a in an absolute sense, right? It's only meaningful relative to other numbers. Whereas being able to say, I can do this and this and this, which you can in pass-based learning, mm. is, uh, is very motivating. Um, but no, I mean, it's not, it's not the best in the sense that, uh, you know, everyone should be doing it. Mm. Um, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's an important component of, of language education. Um, and I think it's an important component um, that, that has to be done in conjunction with um, kinds of teaching that focuses on forms, uh, yeah. focuses on grammar and language forms. Um, but uh, what, what it can't be done is together at the same time. That they are, I, 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 this is, this is a, probably more me now than, than uh, Ellis or Long. Yeah. Although I think, I, I think Long would, would agree um, that they are, they're mutually exclusive. You, you can't do uh, TBLT uh, as a kind of compromise with grammar focused teaching right. um, they're two different things yep. you, you, you I, I do believe that you have to do them you need both of them yeah uh, but you can't do them at the same time right uh, so I, ideally what I would recommend is a course in which you do you focus on grammar forms and, and teach that and then a separate course in which you it, it's all purely uh, communicative and in nature. I often, I often say this when I was in the high school for years, they had mm. English five days a week. Four mm. days were based on teaching grammar. And right. then one day was based on, you know, oral communication. And I would have switched it. I would have, mm. I would have had, you know, one day on, on grammar, as you've just said, and I'd have mm. at least two or three days on task-based or application or, you know, I have one day on real writing, you know, a, a different kind of focused output. Right, right. Well, I, I, I think that the number of days, the, the, the amount of focus on each can be, can, can vary depending on the, on the context and the aims, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, if you've got students who are practicing heavily for, for a test, yep. uh, you know, for TOEFL or something, then perhaps you do want to have a, a stronger, you know, you, you want more hours of grammar focused instruction, perhaps. Yeah. Um, it, it depends on your aims, but, but well, yeah, they, they, have, they have to be separate. Yeah. Um, you, you can't have a course that teaches grammar and then, okay, let's do a little bit of conversation. 
um, because they they clash. They they undermine uh, uh, communicative teaching is undermined by the the grammar teaching because you you can't come into the classroom, teach for example the past perfect, and then set up a communicative task in which you tell the students, oh, don't worry, you don't have to use the past perfect because of course they're going to use it. So right. it restricts, therefore, what they're going to be doing and it undermines the, the, the free and open nature of communication, mm -hmm. right? Um, which is why I, I, I don't think they can be done at the same time, but they, they do need to be done sort of in conjunction uh, near, near each other. Mm. Uh, these these are all some of the questions I'm going to be um, explaining and exploring in the course that, that I'm doing for ITDI. Mm. Uh, I'm already planning on, on, on setting it out. Um, yeah, I think at the end here, if uh, Phil may have stepped away, but at the end we're going to show everybody the course that's starting on March 1st um, called Task-Based Language Teaching, I believe. And um, mm -hmm. Marcos, you did uh, one course with us a few years ago now. Right. Um, possibly on extensive reading? Yeah, it was on reading, that's right. Yeah. Um, and uh, adapting texts uh, for reading. Mm. So it, it so you seemed to jump on this idea when we approached you to do one, because we, we all see you working on uh, you know, the TBL stuff. And, and we thought, wow, because your last course was very well attended and well received. So um, what was your thoughts about why you might want to do this course? Um, so when, when widgets came out about 10 years ago, I started going around and talking a lot about TBLT. And, and like we said at the beginning, realizing that a lot of teachers don't quite, um, don't quite understand how it, it fits into um, teaching in the classroom and perhaps having tried it and, and not worked yeah um, or, or perhaps having a, you know where, where's my uh, my long book perhaps having you know hit one of these texts that this is a great book very good book but it's absolutely dense and complex um, and, and research heavy so it's not really a very teacherly uh, book it's not something you can read and just jump into the classroom so TBLT for a lot of teachers has been a little bit intimidating. Um, and so they haven't had much luck with it perhaps. Um, and, and then when you add on top of that, things like institutional demands that require, you know, grading to be done in a certain way, that, that kind of, those kinds of restrictions. Um, people have had a really hard time kind of seeing the, the, the benefit and, and how it works, how TBLT works. Yeah. Um, and that's been why I've been going around talking about it. And, and that's why I kind of jumped on this course because I, I want to do something that will make it clear how, how it works. TBLT assessment is really easy, um, but it's not commonplace because teachers don't quite know how to, how to set it up. Um, and, and this is what you, you get that effect that I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, which is you know, you set up a communicative activity and then you have to give the students a score. So what do you do? Well, you start checking off grammar mistakes that they might have made just because you need to give them a number, a score yep. of some yep. kind. Yep. Um, because that's that's kind of what something we fall back on, isn't it? And, and you fall back on it because you're familiar with it and it's easy to do, right? Yep. Um, yep. Any one of us could write a, a grammar quiz, you know, a multiple choice quiz in, in, in half an hour, right? Um, and we know that it works fairly well for what it is. Mm. Um, and so we tend to fall back on that because the, the, the other option is, is not so clear. It's like, well, how do I assess, yeah. how, how do I grade, you know, in a, in a And will people way? learn that in this course you're doing? For yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you, you can learn that in, in, in two minutes. Um, I, I've already told you, in fact, how to do it. Yeah, um, yeah. Does it satisfy you, the, the nature of that's what right. it's That's right. It's a two-step process. Number yeah. one, ask yourself, does it, is it adequate? Yep. As, a, as a task, right? Yep. So if it's a thank you letter, does it satisfy? Is it, it, does it thank mm -hmm. the, the reader? Um, and then the second step is, is then think about how good it was. So it, it's something you can, you can actually do on the fly um, yep. Yep. in the classroom. It's not that hard to do. Mm. Uh, but you do need to be aware of the principles of TBLT because otherwise you don't realize how a, a grammar test will undermine what you've just done. 
right, um, right. There have been a there have been a number of questions that have just popped in, and mm -hmm. I'm going to read a couple of them to you. And if you want to jump on them, and uh, go ahead. And if not, defer them to come take the course if, if okay. it's too long for right now. Um, can we bring all real world situations into the classroom mm -hmm. in order to satisfy the feature of authenticity? Yeah. So. I, I think the best way to think about authenticity is a, is a kind of ideal that never really gets met. Um, you you, you want to keep that in mind because it helps you to, it gives you a, a, a target, a sort of a way forward. Uh, but at the same time, you have to realize that anything you bring into the classroom, just by definition, by, by the fact that it's in the classroom, becomes more and more pedagogic in nature. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, if you, if you have your students do some kind of role play where they're, you know, being waiters and, and, and customers at a restaurant. Yeah. You can, you can imagine how you can set up a task that's fairly authentic that way, right? Mm. Um, but it's never going to be as authentic as if you actually get up and go to a, to a restaurant. Um, now, if you get up and go to a restaurant with your students as the teacher, even there, there's a certain element of, you know, sort of the, just the power of structure of having a teacher nearby uh, influences how, how they may or may not communicate freely and so on. Yeah, yeah. So authenticity is, is, is not, you know, it, it's kind of the holy grail, but you never really, it, right. it's not feasible to, to reach it. So you, you, you do have to bring some element of real worldliness yeah. um, to yeah. the classroom. Um, so and, and the more you... Yeah, but, somebody's asked here how to select adequate topics, and that, that would be just a, an easy Google search in many ways, wouldn't it? T, T, yeah. T topics or, or what, what? Topics are... Depends what they of, mean by that, right? Yeah, it, it depends what you mean by topics. I mean, TBLT isn't really about topics in that sense. It's, right. it's kind of like topic agnostic in a way. Yeah, um, yeah. If you were doing a task like a lecture, for example, as a task, yeah. then that would, of course, need to have some kind of topic. Um, but the topic isn't, and, and, and in, in how you set up that particular task, the topic, of, of course, would be important. But it's not like task-based learning doesn't depend on having a, a sort of a range of topics or particular right. topics. Right. right. Um, Another one here, wondering about the tension between real world situations and imagining situations that students might not have uh, experience with. Yeah, um, okay, that's a, yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. And it's something that I think does complicate the, the complexity of the task. If somebody doesn't, if somebody hasn't actually, doesn't have the background knowledge that they haven't done something in particular, um, that does make the task much more complex. Um, and depending, of course, you've got, for example, if you've got students who are young learners versus adults, uh, there are things that young learners and adults can sort of conceptualize and therefore do. Uh, widgets, for example, is a simulation of a workplace environment. Yep. So it doesn't really work with junior high school students, for example, who can't really imagine being in an office kind of environment, but it works very well with university students who are already thinking that way and, and even better with people who are actually in that environment to begin with. Mm. Um, so there's yeah, a common the, sense element there too, isn't there? The what there element? There's a common sense element. Oh, yes. Yeah. That you shouldn't be looking at widgets for, you know, a, a beginning junior high school class. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But, but if you could, for example, in, in Japan, they do things like uh, culture festivals at the junior high schools and so on. So if you were to set up, for example, an English course for junior high school in which the students would um, plan and execute a kind of cultural festival, uh, you know, set up booths and you, yeah. you, you know what they do in, in Japan. If you were to do that in a task-based uh, sort of way, that would be quite authentic for, for mm. them because it's something that they do. But if you were to take that set of lessons and then take it to Canada, where students don't know what a cultural festival is at junior high school, then yeah. it becomes very inauthentic, right? Yeah. 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 
So do you feel like, um, I guess there, what I'm feeling from these questions, there, there's a, a bunch of them about how about or how, and so there seems to be uh, um, uh, maybe a lack of confidence in knowing how to get the most out of a task-based learning approach. Do you feel like in a month in your course that people will come out feeling a lot more clarity than the kind of confusion that, that might be a first reaction to TBLT sometimes? Um, I, I think so. I, I, I think what, I mean, my, what I've been thinking about really hard over the last 10 years has mm -hmm. been how to um, present and, and prepare people to do TBLT and, and to understand the purpose of it in, in practical ways. Um, lately, I've been using an analogy of uh, driving, learning to drive, right? Yeah. Which is, uh, you know, if you're, if you're learning to drive, you, you go for lessons and you do two things. One of them is you, you learn all the road signs and you learn all the, uh, you know, the rules of the road. And, and, and the most efficient way of doing that is to just have a teacher stand in front of you and, and you go through it and then you do quizzes and yeah. so on, right? That, that part of language teaching is well established. Um, the part we don't have, especially in an EFL environment, is the other part of learning to drive, which is actually getting into a car and going around the city. Right? Yeah. Um, and that's what's missing in an EFL environment. That's what TBLT provides, because it helps you to, to set up that kind of um, lesson. Yeah. Um, and not only the lesson itself, but the assessment of it. So when you get assessed for learning to drive, you, you do have a paper test and you have a practical test where you sit with a, an instructor and they see you drive and, and then you, you, you pass or don't at the end, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and that part especially is what's missing in language teaching, even in CBLT. It's, it's the, 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 the grading side of things. How do you do that in a kind of efficient way? So uh, that's, the, that's the next question here, which says specifically, is scoring within this approach beyond mathematical calculation? Well, you know, I, I, I teach in a real world program too, and I have to give grades at the end of the semester. I have to yep. give the students some kind of a number based or, or letter based at least grading. Um, so yeah, you, you can do, you, you can kind of correlate to uh, some kind of scoring rubric. Um, the, the, the problem is, is doing it in a way that's appropriate. So that, that, that sort of model that I gave you before, right? The, the two-step model. The, the first step is yes, no. Um, if you're thinking on a 10-point scale, for example, yes, no. Well, yes would be from 6 to 10, for example, if you have to give a score, right? So you, you make that decision, yes. So you know that the score is between 6 and 10. Now the second step is, let's see how good it was. And you can, for example, look at descriptor systems that might help you to, to achieve a number between six and like, 10. Like some kind of rubric. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so in the end, you, you, you do end up with a numerical score. Um, actually, I'm, the, the research I'm involved in right now is basically trying to prove, uh, not trying to prove, we're trying to see whether um, that kind of scoring is reliable enough um, and, and I think it is from, from my preliminary finding, uh, and, and I'll be demonstrating this in the course a little bit. Um, if, we, if we look at a task being performed, even without any rater training, we tend to generally gravitate towards a, a number from one to 10 as to how good it was. Um, and, and just a, on an intuitive level, teachers are pretty good at doing that. Um, but we, we tend to, not trust ourselves you know we, we tend to think oh this is far too subjective uh, i better give some other kind of testing you know i better give a grammar test just to be sure um and the grammar test is is not very valid uh, in, right. in, in assessing this kind of learning so mm. uh, but 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 that's it's a big part of the course that, that's coming up yeah I'm not, uh, uh, we've got a question here I'm going to read to you and I'm, I'm reading it in two different ways and tell me if it's clear to you. Would it be a good idea to prepare prospective teachers through task-based learning where the real teaching work begins? I'm not sure what it, 
Yeah, that's why I, I lost it at the end of that one. If you want to try again on that. Um, well, what I, what I would say, though, is that think of TBLT as, as another tool in your belt. Um, and, and it's something that I think teachers should have a, a very good understanding of, um, even if they may not be able to apply its principles uh, entirely in their own classroom. At least you know you're not applying the principles, and I think that's important. Um, in, in my own school, for example, you know, our, the, the program that I run is, is not particularly task-based, um, and it can't be for a variety of reasons. Hmm. Um, but knowing that it's not task-based is already an important step, I think. Um, and I think if teachers have that tool in their belt and they know at least how to use it, even if they don't end up using it every day, Mm. is is a really important thing um yeah being able to assess communicative ability is really important to to teachers of languages obviously yeah. and it's not something teachers intuitively know how to do uh, from yeah. the beginning mm. so um I, i'm gonna kick this one more time in terms of the learning curve for teachers that have heard about this tbl or you know they do a celta they basically learn the ppp method in a, in a CELTA course, but people have heard about this TBL or TBLT. Um, do you feel like the learning curve is something they could leave a month after working in a community uh, of teachers on this course with you, uh, feeling ready to, to um, start building it into their, their approach? Yeah, I, I, I think it is. Um, yeah. I, I, I think the, the, the basics of TBLT are, are not that difficult to grasp. Right. Um, the, uh, the, the more difficult questions, I mean, not, not difficult so much as the, the, the more challenging questions a, a little bit later, are things like, um, you know, so once you understand what a task is and what the parameters of, you know, how, how to delineate what a task is, uh, the real question then becomes, how do you sequence tasks in a way that's helpful, right? Mm. Um, so task sequencing is really important. I mean, lesson sequencing is really important in, in teaching, right? Yep. So learning how to sequence tasks in a way that's kind of maximally um, helpful to students yep. is a bit of a trick. That, that takes a little bit of practice, um, but the, the basic concept of how to do it is not that hard to grasp sure, right sure. Um, so the awareness of the importance of that and then yeah. practicing the the number of hours it takes you to get there yeah right yeah, right sure. and and it's you know like with anything else there's a, sure. there's a certain amount of trial and error sure um, sure that, sure that we go through. um and do you do you advocate that there is a way to do tblt with young learners with junior high school high school university adults or or do you uh push nudge people away from any particular contexts or levels i i wouldn't nudge them away from any in, any particular context or levels um and and i wouldn't say that there's a different way of doing it the the way of doing it is is the same mm. uh, but you do you i mean with with younger learners you you can um you know they'll 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 anything is a game to a kid for example so that it in terms of engagement for example it may be more efficient to play some kind of vocabulary game that they'll enjoy playing that adults might kind of not see the the ultimate goal for doing yeah um the the principles are the same it's just you you may want to change up how much you do of tblt versus um, forms focused uh, instruction depending on the age level and, and motivation and so on yeah, I mean when somebody's just said games are among the most authentic tasks for kids yeah I, I, I mean remember that the word authenticity is problematic right yeah um, sure, sure. They, 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 uh, games are contrived in ways that make them not real world like except that on a meta level of course we play games in the real world so they yeah. are real world like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So there's, there's this whole yeah. sort of philosophical yeah. yeah um but kids get into games in a in a 
much more engaged way than adults do. So I think you could make the argument that to them, it feels a lot more authentic yeah, um, sure. than to sure. adults. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that's another, you know, sort of um, variable that the teacher has to work with. And, and I think the, the, the really important thing is, is for the teacher in the classroom to, to basically, if you understand the principles of TBLT, you can play with these variables in your own classroom um, and, and the variables of, of task complexity, for example, um, are, are they, it can't be set out in a textbook because there's so many, so many different ways in which a task is more or less complex depending on the individual. But the, so a textbook can't do that for you, but a teacher can do it because you're there in the classroom right. and you can see, um, you can moderate the, the tasks yep. for the student which means that we all have to have a little bit of, you know, a certain basic level of proficiency in yep. understanding what TBLT is to be able to do that. Yeah. Hmm. Um, we're running out of time, but I want to uh, talk a little bit about what you are, what are you looking for? <laughs> I don't have dressing here. That was I'm surprised a, that hasn't happened here too, actually, but sorry. We got, we got a big go men eye, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, maybe some broad strokes on what you're uh, hoping to accomplish in your one month course, just for anybody that's hearing it for the first time. Um, we have four live sessions on, on Sundays, and then we work throughout the month in the, in the forum, uh, completing homework and, and communicating and, and uh, doing some kind of a, feedback with each other and, and communication but what, what are you hoping to uh, get from yeah it, it, it's it's going to be a little bit of a crash course in task-based learning but by by the end of it i think teachers will be very comfortable uh, understanding what it is um, how to assess it uh, how to sequence it into a syllabus uh, how to make a syllabus basically um, and, um, and 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 basically you know be, be comfortable understanding what it is and what it isn't, what it can do and what it can't do. Um, so I'll be, I'll be setting it up with a, a little bit of reading. It's not, it's not going to be very heavy on, uh, on academic reading, but I'll, I'll have a little bit because it's important to understand the, the principles and the theory yep. behind it. Mm. Um, and uh, quite a bit of sort of practical work, you know, so the, the homework will be things like the design a task, um, and then um, des des describe the complexity of that task in, in according to various uh, variables that we will be talking about. Mm. Um, it, not not very difficult, basically. The, the the kind of thing we do in the classroom now. Yeah. Right? So when you when you're teaching a class and you're you're thinking of a new lesson, you'll you'll think about how to present it to the students. You'll think about how to test it afterwards and so on. We'll be doing that kind of thing, but with tasks um, rather than with other PPP uh, P type yeah, of yeah. lessons. Well, I don't mean to put any pressure on you, but I skipped over a comment early on, which was Marcos's last course was amazing. So um, no pressure, buddy. Whatever the <laughs> next notch up from amazing is, we, we hope we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. Um, uh, and just just a bit of um, uh, advertising here. Barb has put a message in that we launched 20% uh, uh, off for the first 20 people who use the code HAPPY2020 on Ooh. all of our products. It was this uh, thing we came up with. So um, anybody who's thinking about it, get over there and, and uh, you can click on the link and like I said, we'll, we've got it set to shut off this 20% um, this discount for um, once 20 people have signed up for anything from our uh, TESOL certificate to our self-study courses or to any of these live upcoming courses. So, um, hmm. wow, that's great. Um, what, uh, can you give us a, a little teaser on um, your next uh, challenges in, Professionally, we'll, we'll leave it the personal stuff out, but professionally, what are you dabbling in or thinking about or working on? 
Uh, yeah, a couple of things. So, well, right now I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get this research underway on, um, on task assessment. So yep. I'll be presenting at uh, the ILA conference in yep. the Netherlands, excuse me, in August. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, it, it's exciting because I, I, I'm hoping to show how task-based assessment is much easier to do than, than we give it credit for. Sure. Uh, right, right now, the way it's done is through these descriptor systems like the Common European Framework. And uh, it works really well. But it requires a lot of radar training. Yeah. Um, so it's it's good for research. It works well for research and for um, tests like the TOEFL. You know, sort of more systematized. Yeah. Um, but uh, in the classroom, it, it it's a uh, it, it can't really be done. We can't expect teachers to be able to refer to a three hundred page language descriptor descriptor system. Yeah. Just to be able to do grading in the classroom. So I'm I'm that's pretty exciting. Um, right now and I'm also uh, I'm, I'm teaching a new course a new literature course at my university this semester oh, wow. it should be fun I'm gonna be talking about Peter Pan and Dracula uh, which are two uh, books that I really enjoyed the novel Peter Pan Wow um, which is uh, is there is there yeah. any connection between the two or are they your school there are, there are many connections actually you should take that course <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, they're, they're, they're both immortal. They live forever. They're forever young, right? Oh, um, oh. They both have trouble with their shadow. Uh, they both, um, well, it's, it, there's a lot of uh, uh, Freudian psychoanalysis in a literary criticism perspective uh, in that wow. course. Wow. What, what year students would take this? They will be the English majors uh, at uh, Obiring who are doing literature. Uh, they usually study literature in Japanese only. So this is a kind of a test course to see wow. if, uh, if it's feasible to have an actual content course teaching English. In, oh, I in can English. just see you bouncing around because you like the oh, topic, yeah. hey? That sounds exciting. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, that was my first love in, uh, in university. I, yeah. I really got into literary theory uh, in my undergrad. Oh. So yeah. being able to yeah. teach some of that now and then is, uh, is exciting. Yeah. So let me just, while we've got everybody here, uh, I'm going to just hang on just a sec. I'm going to um, uh, share the screen just for a moment to show you what things look like. Um, this is the itdi.pro page, itdi.pro. And on one of the tabs, we have here courses. And we can see under the courses, you'll see advanced skills courses live. We call them live or self-study. And um, the, what, what a, the three of our, our greatest uh, friends here between uh, Marco's doing his second course and, and Catherine Billsborough possibly doing her fourth course, her and um, Dorothy Zemak both doing their fourth courses with us and and it's a scramble to get into these courses because everybody likes them so much but um, if you go to these pages you can then click on learn more for uh, a more detailed look whether that's going to take me there we'll see if it takes me there while I'm in the actually I got it right here look at that um, so it's got an introduction to what, what it is, and then it shows that you can do three different levels of this course, a certificate of distinction, accomplishment, or, or completion. And then um, we've got the, about the course, what, what uh, uh, you'll be doing and, and getting. And we also have a thing that ITDI always offers uh, a certain number of scholarships based on um, how many other people are in the course. But we fully believe that everyone deserves um, a uh, equal opportunity to improve themselves as teachers. And uh, if you don't have that kind of money, if that kind of money happens to be what you make in a month, uh, in, in a country somewhere. We don't want that to be uh, stopping everybody from having a chance and therefore we have scholarships available to, to certain people and there's a scholarship application button there. Um, and I finished with two seconds left. Do you want to say anything on the wrapping up um, or inviting people to um, 
I don't think I can say anything in only two seconds. So yeah. <laughs> it takes me uh, about two minutes to even get started. Yeah, yeah. So um, we got a, a thank you there. Uh, thanks, Victor. Uh, it was an empowering session. So that was very nice. Uh, oh, thank you. Again, it's, um, it's, it's a big topic. And like I said, we could have talked about it for two or three hours pretty easily. So this was hopefully whetting the appetite of uh, people who are interested in, as you said earlier, putting this in your tool box or in your tool belt to be able to have confidence to use it in, in appropriate situations as an approach and to, to learn how to play with it, how to work with it, how to assess it. So if you're interested, I, I, can, um, uh, I can absolutely guarantee you'll learn things. I learned lots of stuff in your last uh, uh, course that you did with us. It was great fun to host you and to kind of learn along with everybody. So I want to say a big thank you to uh, you, Marcos, and everybody else who's come in. Uh, thanks to those who have added questions. And um, this will be available if you want to watch it again or, or introduce it to your friends. It'll be available on YouTube in about a week. Uh, we normally, we? yeah, normally we, we uh, will edit it a little bit and then the following Tuesday, it's Tuesday night in Japan right now, but the following Tuesday, we will um, put it up uh, for anybody. So there you go. With that, um, we'll say thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, yeah, and uh, I hope I get to see you uh, in person um, one of these days. Yeah, well, come to Tokyo. We're not that far away from each other. But That's right, I will. So okay. See you. see you again soon. Cheers. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michael Bye. and Anne and Andy and Barb and Harmony. Thanks. And Thanks for coming, everyone. Sorry, I haven't been able to see the uh, list, so. That's okay. Yep. Yeah, I'm working off that iPad. Part. I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. Oh. Phil, are you there? Yes, I am. And obviously, the uh, Facebook Live version is up already and available for everybody live. Oh, that's right. Yeah, the Facebook. And so forth. Yeah, um, that's right. That's an automatic. Um, that will go up tonight, Marcos, on the on oh, Facebook. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's up already. It's up so it's Facebook already. Live, but not live. Oh, it's live. Uh, yeah. It is live. What we we're still on live on Facebook. Oh no! I, but yeah, but once we finish, it's not going to be accessible on Facebook anymore. Yes, it will is be. It? Yeah, yep. automatically, oh, okay. it's 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 just saved as a as a clickable video. As a video. Oh, okay, great. Okay. Yeah. So thank you very much, everyone who's watched us on Facebook as well. Uh, we appreciate all the comments and questions that added to the discussion, and we'll be saying good morning, good day, good good night. Yay! Thank bye you. Bye bye. Bye bye.